Hello everyone, my name is Sebastian and I'm CTO and co-founder of DC Spark. And in this video, I'll talk about a overview of data availability solutions out there. Notably, I'll talk about why people are so interested in these data availability solutions. For example, Bitcoin's interested, Cardano's interested, ZK blockchains like Mina are interested. Why are they so interested? And I'll talk about many different projects that are providing solutions to this problem. Uh, and then I'll also talk about, you know, what is data availability and, and why is it so useful? So if you're interested in this kind of educational topic, be sure to like and subscribe. We usually have way more views than actual subscribers. So if you like this kind of educational educational content, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. So motivation, why is it so important? So if you look at Bitcoin, you might have noticed that recently people are trying to do NFTs on Bitcoin. But what are the problems with NFTs on Bitcoins right now? One of the main problems is that the amount of data you can actually upload to the Bitcoin blockchain is fairly limited. And so if you look at these collections, they tend to have low resolution images, and then they also tend to be fairly expensive to mint. And so this is because Bitcoin explicitly tries to have kind of low data uh, available to users. So you can't just upload gigabytes of data to the Bitcoin blockchain. So how, how could you solve this problem? Well, the naive way of solving this problem is just to increase the amount of data Bitcoin allows. And in fact, if you're old, you might remember Bitcoin SV, Bitcoin Cash, these projects that tried to do this. And the main problem is that it hurt decentralization. And so if you are running a node that cannot handle a gigabit of data per minute, um, then you would just be kind of unable to run a full node, which hurts decentralization. So to avoid this, projects like Bitcoin and Cardano explicitly limited the amount of data that is allowed on their chain to try and maximize decentralization. And projects like Mina, which are ZK-based chains, um, also probably took this into account, but more so they also have additional constraints on their ZK system that may force them to have um, low data at, um, available inside the layer one directly. And so one of the main motivations for this actually is, is something called layer two solutions. If you don't know what a layer two is, it's basically a way to embed a new virtual machine inside an existing blockchain. So you can think of this giant green box as a layer one, for example, Bitcoin, and you can think of this, this blue as a new virtual machine embedded inside a larger blockchain. So for example, people have used this to embed new ZK virtual machines inside Ethereum. And so really exciting um, domain to look into. And in fact, DC Spark's also doing a lot of work in this domain. Uh, but there's you know one main problem, which is that what if the state of the virtual machine you're embedding, this blue box, is larger than what is allowed by Bitcoin or larger than what is allowed by Cardano or Mina or any other project. Well, then there's no way for all the global participants of the network to agree on these current states of the layer two. And so obviously this is not great. And so we need a new kind of peer to peer uh, network storage layer that is somehow able to uh, broadcast and agree on the state of the layer two. And so what do we need to achieve this? Well, the two core properties are somehow knowing the current state and then two, knowing the historical state. And so somehow we need to be able to have these two properties. And notably, we'd like to be able to have these two properties in a way that is cryptographically verifiable. Why is this so important? Well, for example, in Bitcoin's case, we would like to embed this new virtual machine inside Bitcoin, right? Um, but imagine at some point there's some malicious actor who decides not to share the current state. They'll keep it for themselves. They'll never share with anybody. And that means that everybody who's using this layer two solution no longer knows this current state of layer two. And so they cannot create new transactions or progress the state of layer two. So um, proving that the current state is known to everybody is super important. And uh, the best way to be able to do that is to have some kind of cryptographic proof that you really did share the state with everybody and make this cryptographic proof a requirement for updating these states on the layer one. That's why this is so important. And so multiple projects have tried to uh, tackle this. And so let's go through them uh, one by one. So first IPFS. Now IPFS is slightly special in that um, it's not really meant for this kind of use case um, because you can think of this layer two as a global system. Everybody wants to agree on you know one set of data where IPFS tends to be more like on a file per file basis. 
um, not somehow trying to maintain the state of a ever moving uh, virtual machine. Uh, so it's a little bit different and, and IPFS is, is not really great at these cryptographic proofs, at least not at the moment, um, because as we'll see a bit later, there's some new interesting crypto cryptographic techniques that can get us uh, one and two uh, much better than what you would get in IPFS. And so there's some better solutions out there. So to talk about Celestia, which is one of the main data availability solutions out there at the moment, we first have to talk about what cryptography is required to get one and two to perform better. Notably, um, there's kind of three and four, three, three point five in a sense techniques that I want to talk about. One is Reed Solomon encodings. So if you don't know, Reed Solomon is uh, error encoding scheme, and so. Um, you don't have to know how this works in detail, and I, I won't cover it much in the video, but you can look more into it in, on your own time if you're interested. Next one is 2D Read Solomon, which is a performance increase for data availability use cases on the traditional Read Solomon, so that sometimes this is called 1D for that reason. Oops. 1D. And then another one is called Coded Merkle Trees which gives even um, better performance characteristics. And usually all these solutions are combined together with something called KZG commitment, which is a way to aggregate these proofs so you can easily do multi proofs. Um, and this is really important for the historical state because if you can imagine the state of a, a network, it evolves over time, right? And oops and the state of the network is ever evolving. And so if you want to prove that somebody is storing the historical state, one uh, interesting way to do this is to challenge them on random parts of the historical state. So say, okay, give me the state of block two, give me the state of block four, and give me the current state. You just um, challenge them on, on, by asking them to prove that they know the data of random blocks. And KZG commitments allow you to combine multiple proofs together very efficiently. And so it allows this kind of challenge mechanism to be significantly more performant than um, doing these one by one. So instead of doing prove me two, prove me four, prove me current, you somehow be able to aggregate all these together into a single uh, proof. And so that's why KZG is a popular technique. So now that you have some background for some of the cryptography, um, innovate, cryptographic innovations that people are, are working on for this kind of data available solutions, we can go back to Celestia. Now, Celestia currently implements the 2D read Solomon encoding and does not implement KCG. So it's um, on the way there. There's more innovation they could bring, but obviously these are complex problems and you have to solve them one step at a time. And so if 2D read Solomon without KCG is good enough for you now, then Celestia might be a good solution. Uh, but also keep in mind that Celestia uses kind of traditional cryptographic techniques for uh, cryptographic curves, hashes, signatures for their chain as well. And so this is usable for uh, Bitcoin and Cardano. It's not usable for Mina, which has more uh, cryptographic requirements because it needs to be cryptographic proofs that work well under a ZK setting. Notably, uh, Mina cannot at the moment process KZG commitments uh, because it's lacking um, the cryptography available in smart contracts to actually do this. And so, Okay, now we understand where Celestia is at and a bit more on Celestia, it uses Cosmos SDK and notably it uses Tendermint, uh, which is nice because they get fast finality with no rollbacks, which is a great properties for a data layer. It has no program uh, programmability, so you cannot deploy smart contracts to Celestia. And so it's meant purely as a data layer and not anything as anything else. Um, this may be tricky for your use case if you want to have some additional processing uh, or rules on the way the data is handled, um, but still keep that in mind. And yeah, that's kind of an overview of Celestia and where they're at. Obviously they have an ambitious roadmap and we'll see where they go. Another project on the list is Polygon Avail. So Polygon Avail is a data availability layer provided by Polygon, the same company who created the Polygon blockchain and is working on the Polygon ZKVM and a few other things. So Polygon Avail, um, has coded Merkle trees and has KCG, but the problem is that the development stopped 
partway through. And what it seems to have happened according to the GitHub is that they were working with Nomad for the implementation. Nomad, as you may know, is a bridge project that got hacked and um, mostly stopped um, working on, on these kinds of projects. And so it seems to have put Polygon Avail on pause. Unfortunately, because they seem to have some good, you know, cryptography and, and techniques available. And it was based on the Substrate SDK, which is in the Polkadot ecosystem. Um, so it had you know, some good things going for it, but unfortunately um, did not survive. It also implements um, AD25519, which is the cryptography required for Cardano. I don't think Bitcoin has this, um, and Mina um, is not really based off of this. Again, they would need some customs and better cryptography for it specifically. And so uh, that's kind of a cryptographic overview of Polygon Avail. So now let's talk about Chia. Now Chia is fairly different. So Chia is a proof of space time blockchain. So it's not a data layer per se, but it's a blockchain that is uh, very familiar with data heavy use cases. And in fact, they provide kind of an off chain data storage called uh, data layer. Now you can think of data layer as a off chain storage system based off a of PubSub model. So somebody stores data and whenever the um, data changes, you uh, announce that the data changed and you notify everybody and then everybody pulls the latest data. So it's kind of a traditional PubSub model, but the interesting thing is that it uses the Chia blockchain as the coordination layer. So the Chia uh, blockchain has some functionality built in that allows you to basically have a UTXO entry. So um, Chia is by the way, like a UTXO like blockchain, they call it coins, but it's, it's basically uh, UTXO like, just like Bitcoin, just like Cardano, they're UTXO based. And so whenever you update this smart contract or this coin, they call it on uh, Chia, you can do two things. You can one, you can update the data inside this data layer. And two, you can have a proof of inclusion Now, this is interesting because it means that you can basically have your layer two state stored inside a coin on Chia. And then every time you update the state of that coin, you can create a proof of inclusion. And then everybody who's running data layer, who's currently looking at that state will basically see um, this proof of inclusion, see the announcement, connect to it and know to pull any new data available. So kind of an interesting technique. Um, Chia also does have um, BLS curves at the layer one which is a requirement for implementing KZG. So actually they are able to provide this as well, um, but their current data layer solution does not use this. Instead, it uses basically a key value table um, where basically rows are, are hashed together using, I believe, shop 256. And then the root of this Merkle tree from all these hashes are basically what's uh, stored inside uh, this box. And so um, that makes that, it can't really be used for uh, Mina or, or some of these ZK projects because they don't have um, the ability to verify these cryptographic primitives. Um, but there's kind of a path to it because you could create a different uh, data layer solution on Chia that uses some different cryptography based off the same primitives. And so there's kind of a path forward. Um, so that's kind of Chia in a nutshell. One of the main problems with Chia is the consensus. So notably they have 52 second transaction blocks. So it's fairly uh, slow as a blockchain. And then not only that, but because it's not um, any kind of like proof of stake model, they have a proof of space time. It's kind of like Bitcoin where you have a probabilistic finality. And so the time for the data to become finalized is also fairly long. And so that's um, problematic as well. They, because they are proof of work like, they do support um, some things like fly clients. Um, so they, they don't have exactly the same, the same thing, but it's you can um, think of it as like a light client solution for Chia that is possible to write because of their um, proof of space time model. Um, but I'm not sure if there's a mature solution available currently. And um, even if you do have one because of the block time and the finality, this is kind of hard to work with. So this is the main disadvantage of the Chia solution, um, but I do have some kind of interesting existing work out there. Next, let's talk about Algorand. So Algorand is a proof of stake blockchain that uses BFT. This is really nice because it gives Algorand instant finality, which is really great for a data layer. And notably, it has a solution called Box Storage. 
So by the uh, Algram block times are four seconds about. Um, so also very fast, uh, way faster than Chia. And the way block, uh, box storage works is also kind of like a um, key value pair. Um, so basically you can have, um, it to associates your smart contract, a list of boxes and each box uh, contains at most 32 kilobytes. And, but you can have basically uh, multiple boxes available at a time. So if your box, one box is not enough, you can just have your um, layer two use many boxes at once. And so you pay based off uh, kilobytes. So if somebody is accessing the state of your layer two, for every kil kilobyte of data that they access from your layer two or write to your layer two, they pay for it and it's also relatively cheap. So Algorand is interesting because it has the right cryptography for um, Cardano and, and Bitcoin. I believe it has um, uh, SEPS 256K1 as well as ED2519. It is also adding BLS curves. So it also has it's adding the right cryptography for KZG. And it's also adding a few other curves um, that might make it work for Amina in the future as well. And that's kind of something that the Algorand team is working on. So from this perspective, they also have a lot of the right cryptography. One of the interesting things about Algorand as well is they have something called state proofs, which is a way to easily do light clients to other blockchains. So that's, for example, on Ethereum layer one, you could access um, states on the Algorand network and, for example, prove that somebody has a certain balance on the Algorand network. Now, current state proofs for Algorand are purely for algo balances. You can prove the balance of somebody's account. But what um, they could do, which would be really interesting, is that you could have all the box storages on the Algorand blockchain and you could aggregate all of them together into a, a data storage state proof. And then you'll be able to send that data storage state proofs to other blockchains so that you could, for example, from the Ethereum blockchain, um, prove that certain data was added to a box on Algorand and, and properly uh, synchronized between all Algorand validators. So from this perspective, Algorand is really strong, really strong block time, really strong um, cryptographic primitives, has a really good roadmap for adding this kind of, of like client solution to embed into other blockchains um, and very cheap to do this as well. So that's Algorand. And lastly, Ethereum is also working on its own data available solution for its own blockchain. Um, notably, you might've heard them um, talk about 2D uh, Reed Solomon encodings. You might've heard of them talk about uh, KZG. You might have heard of EIP 4844. And so there's many things on the Ethereum roadmap related to data availability. Um, and uh, they have a fairly complex roadmap. And so I, I encourage you to look into it if you want to learn more about what Ethereum is doing. Ethereum is, is more building a solution for themselves instead of uh, for others. Um, but it does have a lot of the right cryptographic uh, primitives available as well. And uh, um, Ethereum does have a fairly fast finality. They have a finality gadget um, for their proof of stake implementation. One of the main problems with Ethereum is that it's very hard to prove the state of the Ethereum blockchain inside other blockchains. So for example, knowing the state of Ethereum from Cardano or from Mina is uh, very hard. In fact, one of the reasons why we've seen so many bridge hacks over the past years is because Ethereum is one of the main blockchains that people want to bridge to but proving state of Ethereum in other blockchains is one of the hardest um, directions. Um, and so that's why it leads to so many uh, bridge hacks. So although Ethereum might have a lot of the right cryptography, it has a good roadmap, um, unless there's kind of a, a better bridging option for Ethereum, um, you know, for another blockchain like Algorand um, or Chia uh, or Celestia or Polygon Avail might be better. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of some of the solutions out there. There might be one that I missed and so if you know of a different one, be sure to leave it in the comments below. I'd love to hear your feedback and what you'd like me to explain next. And again, if you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any educational content in the future. So hopefully this was really interesting to all of you and thanks for your time.